Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for your patience as we got started today. Uh, my name is Zami Tanashe Hemingway, and I am the Capacity Building Assistant, SEBA Gender Affirming Project Manager with Denver Prevention Training Center. If everyone could please change their name to their first and last name that you registered under so that we can take attendance, that would be wonderful. In addition to changing your name, if you could include your pronouns so that we can honor everyone here in the room, that would be appreciated as well. So thank you all again for coming to our CLP today. I want to briefly share more information for folks who may be joining us for the first time. As part of Denver PTC SEBA funding, we are providing technical assistance in the West region to CDC directly funded community-based well, organizations. If folks could also, thank you. <laughs> all right. So we work closely with 15 jurisdictions in the West to collabor collaboratively provide services for transgender people in alignment with the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative. If you are not a directly funded organization, we can and will be happy to provide TA support to you as well. Email me at zami.hemingway at dhha.org for additional information. Um, thank you all again for being here. I want to turn it over to Nevea Anderson and Riley, Dr. Riley Smith to begin our conversation on equitable access and representation in sexual health and prep services. Take it away, y'all. Yay. So first off, I would like to thank um, everyone and wish you all a good morning and good afternoon. Thank you so much for participating in this month's community of practice, or as we like to call them CLPs. I'm excited to talk about our topics, equitable access and representation in sexual health and prep services. And I hope you're looking forward to it as well. We have a wealth of information we're ready to share. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first off, my name is Neve Anderson. Um, can you, oh, thank you. <laughs> my name is Neve Anderson and I am the owner, founder, um, go back to the previous slide, right there. Thank you, Zami. Um, and executive director of Simply B LLC, where I simplify and simplify um, complexities around gender, race, and sexuality. I am also an identity consultant with Denver Prevention Training Center. Although I'm not in, um, although I am not the expert, I am an expert on gender diverse issues, disparities, and life experiences. I will now pass it over to another expert who will be co-facilitating this COP with me as well. All right, hi everyone, and thanks, Nevaeh. Uh, my name is Dr. Riley Smith. I'm a family medicine physician at Denver Health in Denver, Colorado. Um, where I practice full scope primary care, including gender affirming care and other sexual health services. Um, I'm also an identity consultant with the Denver Prevention Training Center, um, and I identify as a transgender man and use he, him pronouns. Thank you for that, um, Riley. So today our session will be on equitable access and representation in sexual health and prep services. In this service, I mean, this session, we will describe comprehensive sexual health program and its applications, demonstrate how an equitable and inclusive sexual health programming positively impacts HIV care and prevention and illustrate the importance of health screening and promotions of comprehensive prevention methods, which will include pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. We will conclude with a group brainstorm activity to develop ideas on how your agency can be more inclusive to all genders and sexualities within your sexual health program portfolio. In this session, we will include the following objectives. Describe comprehensive sexual health programming. Demonstrate how equitable and inclusive sexual health programming positively impacts HIV prevention and care. And we will also illustrate the importance of equitable and inclusive health screenings and promotion of comprehensive prevention methods. And before we get started, Let's review some terminology that we will be using throughout this session. Next slide, please. Sexual health. According to the CDC, sexual health is defined as a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well being in relation to sexuality. It is not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. Sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach 
to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. Next slide, please. Comprehensive sexual health happens when sexual health programming and education is medically accurate, evidence-based, and age-appropriate. As a result of comprehensive sexual health programming, it will result in physical, mental, and social well-being in all matters relating to sexual health and the reproductive system. This includes offering a full panel STI HIV test that consists of offering oral and anal swabs to everyone, asking clients who they are, what kind of sex they are having, and the gender identity of their partners. And this includes transgender and gender non-binary individuals. Next slide, please. Gender equity is the process of being fair to women and men. To ensure fairness, strategies, and measures must often be available to compensate for women's historical and social disadvantages that, um, and social disadvantages that prevent women and men from otherwise operating on a level playing field. Equity leads to equality. And this also expands to transgender and gender non-binary individuals. Um, next slide, please. Sexual health programming is successful when services are expansive, inclusive, and culturally aware. In the chat box, can you all provide some examples of sexual health programming? Or you can also unmute and share. Is anyone um, on the call offering full panel STI HIV testing? Hey everyone, my name is Derek. I am um, a child at uh, NASM Inc. and we are offer uh, testing and S uh, for HIV and STI. Thank you for that, Derek. Um, so as we saw, um, one can definitely be um, STI and HIV testing. Um, another one can definitely be um, plan, um, plans, um, sorry, family planning, which will include contraceptives. Um, this can definitely talk about expanding families or preventing pregnancies. Um, another one could be um, around gender related services, such as HRT or other transition related services. So just a few of those examples. Um, maybe if we are talking about testing, um, okay, here goes one from um, Thera, um, offering testing, transportation, food, family planning, and mental health services. That's definitely a good one, um, especially with um, especially with offering transportation or fulfilling other needs. Because as we know, um, HIV testing, sexual health programming, and family planning isn't just as simple as getting tested or getting offered services, um, especially if you're able to cut down or reduce the need. So that's definitely a um, perfect example. Does, um, is anybody here offering transition related services such as HRT or referral for um, referrals to um, transition related surgeries? Hi, good morning. This is Anita Thomas. I work with the Oakland LGBTQ Center. And yes, we um, also provide comprehensive testing, treatment for HIV, STI testing, transportation, um, linkage to our food pantry. And we also do linkage to HR, HRT and gender affirming care as well. Excellent. Thank you so much for providing that. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go ahead and um, let's move forward. Um, so for the folks who did provide examples, uh, here goes one more. Um, Aurora Medina, um, Weld County Health Department, um, also offering um, STI, um, STI testing, PrEP um, slash PrEP so and PrEP and PEP social work services. 
Thank you for including that. And thank you all for being inclusive, um, you know, when, it, when providing your examples. So like some of you all pointed out, some examples of sexual health programming um, includes family planning, um, oh, excuse me, it includes family planning methods. This is such as pregnancy prevention, sperm and or egg freezing, um, also in vitro fertil fertilization, AKA IVF. These type of programmings are standard when working with cisgender populations. And as a reminder, it should also be included when working with transgender and gender non-binary individuals. Sexual health programming for transgender and gender non-binary individuals would also include gender affirming care and trans um, transition related services, as well as full panel STI testing and prevention services, including PrEP, which is the medication that prevents HIV transmission and something that we will go in depth with in session two. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna start by asking a question via poll. The first question is, does your agency offer sexual health programming? The options are yes, no, and I don't know. And we will give you a few moments to plug in your answer. Hi, Nubea, we currently have almost 60% completed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we also have a C in the chat box. Perfect. We are almost to 80%. Once we hit 80%, I will close the poll and share the results. Okay. And Mary also um, stated that she just started her um, new role, so. All right, and the results are posted. Okay, well, thank you all for um, your responses. So it looks like a lot of you do have sexual health programming. Um, there's a few that says that um, you don't, which is totally fine. This is why we're here, right? Um, so before we consider, um, before we continue, what do you all consider comprehensive sexual health screening? And please feel free to either unmute it or put it in the chat. And when we say comprehensive, maybe it's something as simple as um, the way that you're collecting data information, um, who you're marketing to, or your targeted population. And also just be mindful that there is no such thing as a right or wrong answer. I'll share Nevaeh. Uh, when I think about comprehensive sexual health programming, I think about programming that doesn't just focus on behavioral risk or prevention, but programming that focuses on how do you enjoy pleasure when you're engaging in sex? How do you negotiate? Um, what does consent look like when engaging with your partner or partners? Um, and as well as not making assumptions of how you get down based off of your gender identity or gender expression, um, but really allowing us as the participants to be able to express and express judgment free. Definitely, thank you for that, Zami. So basically in short, you're saying that um, folks should be able to participate in their own um, sexual health. Okay, perfect. Um, Derek also put in the chat um, STI slash HIV panels. Um, Derek, I'm gonna ask that you go a little bit more in depth with that when you get a chance. Um, you can always put it in the chat if you would like to. Um, Monica also stated um, obtaining data from clients regarding their gender identity and sexual orientation when completing program intake, which is a good one. So just making sure that you have accurate information. Um, maybe this also includes like, you know, some of the questions that are being asked during, um, during the questionnaire of the testing part, um, as well as their preferred pronouns. And we also have health screening that also takes into account mental health, inclusivity and education. Um, this is from Tiffany. Um, thank you so much for that, Tiffany. 
as that is extremely important. Um, and let's see. Um, how about what services you're offering? Like, or what type of testing you're offering? When you're offering full panel testing, um, it could be one of those things where maybe um, a practice is that you're offering everything to everyone. Um, can anyone speak about that? Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question. Oh, here we go. Um, offering F HIV STI panels to a targeted population that may need additional resources to either get in care, remain in care, or provide prevention, i.e. flat. So definitely working on the scale of equity. Thank you so much for that, Gary. Um, so let's go ahead and go on to the next question. Um, for those of you who have answered yes, what type of sexual health programming does your agency offer? And please feel free to either unmute or put it in the chat box. Oh yeah, so um, let me go ahead and repeat the question. Um, for those of you all who answered yes to our previous call um, about sexual health programming, um, what type of sexual health programming does your agency offer? So this can include um, HIV um, and um, STI testing. This can include um, referrals. This can include um, prep services. This can include um, anything around family planning, this can include anything around transition related services. Um, so one kind of said um, leakage referrals. Um, um, so that's definitely one. Um, I know like with the agency that um, I was a part of, we definitely try to reach out to targeted populations. And we also try to be educated on um, certain topics or certain um, things or um, certain life experiences. So that's kind of what helped us out with um, testing amongst different demographics. That could be used as an example. Rapid HIV testing and PrEP navigation referrals for everyone. So that's definitely um, excellent. So um, Tiara, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, is HIV the only type of testing you all offer or do you all offer um, other STI testing as well? No, we offer gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, as in uh, hepatitis B, uh, uh, rapid testing as well. Uh, okay, yeah. excellent. Um, does any of those um, include um, either oral or anal swabbing? Yes, uh, all of them actually. Okay, and you're offering those to everybody? Yes, ma'am, for George. Excellent. Um, thank you for that. And Tiffany Bellamy says, um, at Vivian Health, we provide wraparound services, um, testing, prep navigation, food bank, and legal services for individuals living with HIV. Definitely sounds like you all are covering the equitable part of it. So um, again, thank you for your response, Tiffany. What does linkage look like for you all? Hi, this is Anita again from Oakland LGBTQ Center. Um, mm -hmm. Linkage for, for me and for, um, well, I don't wanna speak for my other cohorts, but for me, linkage looks like sometimes um, a warm handoff. Sometimes clients feel like um, they could use just a little hand holding, or it may be a challenge for them getting to certain appointments or getting to other uh, places to receive outside services other than what we provide. And so it's okay for us to, you know, engage the client further 
um, and keeping them the focal point like, hey, would you like me to go with you? I can show up with you to your appointment. Or if you need me to go with you, you know, to an outside pharmacy of some sort, you know, I don't mind going with you, you know, things like that. Absolutely. Sounds like you are doing some amazing work over there. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and check the chat. So one means. So um, one literally said that they offered um, H or Jesus said that he off um, that his organization offers HIV testing, syphilis and prep referrals. Um, one said like a linkage literally means a warm handoff or a connection, um, which definitely it is. Um, and then what are some other sexual health programming examples that y'all can think of? Would education kind of come into play? Contraception, pregnancy related care. Leakage can, all, can mean offering help, finding other resources that we have connections to, absolutely. Um, tapping into your social network, tapping into the social network of the community. Okay, um, let's go ahead and um, let's move forward. First off, let me thank you all for your participation um, as these responses were very insightful. Not only were they insightful, but it really highlights the work that you're all um, doing. So just continue to do the wonderful work. So comprehensive sexual health programming is important as well as comprehensive sexual health screenings. Comprehensive sexual health screenings are inclusive to everyone. They promote informed decision-making. They provide equitable family planning, HIV STI prevention and treatments. Um, and care for all. And this is regardless of gender identity or expression. So for example, if you're offering anal exams to cisgender men and transgender women, then the same should be offered to transgender men and other people assigned a female at birth or AFAB individuals. Regardless of what we to believe to be their sexual, own sexual behavior or their own sexual risk. Next, we will have a video from Greater Than AIDS um, the title is hashtag ask the HIV doc, why are black women at higher risk for HIV? And after that, we will also watch a 45 second clip that highlights the call of inclusion of trans masculine individuals in HIV prevention. And this video is courtesy of Gates via YouTube, capital G-A-T-E. So let's go ahead and give those two videos a look. Give me one second, Nabea. Okay. Nevea, go ahead and keep going, and we will let you know when we have the video pulled up. Okay, so until we do have the video up, um, and this is the full video, correct, Nevea? Yes. Perfect. I will start playing this now. In the United States, as quiet as it's kept. One in five HIV infections actually occurs amongst women. And the majority of those women are black women who are infected with HIV. What the data shows is that when you compare black women and white women who are infected with HIV, the black women who become infected with HIV actually have fewer sexual partners, are more likely to use condoms, and yet are more likely to become infected with HIV because there's more HIV in the communities in which they're having sex. Nobody wants to be a statistic, right? You want to be a person. If you're in a community where there's a lot of HIV and you don't know it, the chances of you getting it are higher. We keep thinking of HIV 
as something that only happens in those communities, then we won't get tested because you'll say, oh, that's not me. I don't fit that bill. I'm not that person, so I don't need to get tested. Not because you didn't make all the right choices, but because you allowed the story to stop you from getting tested. Okay, so as you can see, um, that video was an example of why um, gender equity is needed in sexual health programming. Um, the moment that we are able to get the um, trans masculine video, we will make sure to show that. But um, just for the totality of time, we're going to go ahead and move on, um, which leads us to our next question, right? For those of you who do have sexual health programming, A, um, what services are you offering? and B, who are you offering these services to? And I'm going to ask that you either put it in the chat or um, you take yourself off of me. And mind you, um, it could also be um, who is your higher demographic. So if you offer rapid HIV testing, but you notice that a lot of black MSM individuals come to you for testing, um, you can say that. Um, if you are offering PrEP services to um, trans feminine individuals, you know, that's the service that you're offering and, you know, you're offering those services to them as well. So just something amongst that nature. So this is a Tierra again today. Uh, we offer PrEP retention navigation, uh, sorry, uh, referral navigation services as well as retention services uh to uh transgender males and, and basically to anyone in the community is transgender all individuals um as well as a uh weekly uh 30 minute info session provided over zoom specifically directed towards sexual health and uh harm addiction okay absolutely so it sounds like you're offering um your services to everyone and you're trying to be as close as inclusive as you can. So yeah, yes, that's that definitely good. absolutely. So again, thank you for sharing that. You're basically showing that inclusivity and equity is possible. Um, as well as I'm pretty sure a couple of other agencies on the line. Um, so Derek, for example, has HIV and STI testing, leakage to prep, um, PEP, mental counseling, and substance abuse counseling. Um, so, Derek, the question is, who are you offering those services to, um, to be exact? Is anyone offering any services around um, family planning? And if you are, who are you offering your services to? Okay, next slide. Um, thank you for your insightful responses. Um, so since the beginning of our HIV active, activism, research and prevention, oh, here goes one. It Takes a Village offers voices, sex education and transgender community, along with HIV and STI testing at no cost, along with makeovers as well. So it's excellent. Thank you so much for your set. Um, so since the beginning of HIV research, activism, and prevention, we've been programmed to believe that HIV and AIDS were something that heavily impacted sexual and gender diverse groups. We also know that data has been inaccurately collected when it came to certain populations. The main example being transgender women being labeled as MSM individuals or and men who have sex with men. Although we are traditionally taught that cisgender heterosexual individuals are at low risk for HIV. In 2019, 
16% of the newly, newly diagnosed individuals were cisgender heterosexual women. However, this doesn't break down the barriers regarding race, financial class, sex partners or practices, or even gender identity and expression. In fact, Black women are reported to account for 57% of newly HIV diagnoses, and Black women in the South account for 67% of newly HIV diagnoses. Stigma, as well as lack of insurance coverage, contributes as the main factor that women of color, particularly Black women, are affected greater than white women when it comes to HIV prevention and care. Next slide, please. And also to add to that, I'm sorry not to cut you off, also to add to that, um, there may be some, um, this is Anita again, um, this, there may be um, some trans women who don't even identify as transgender. They may be saying that they are, that they are cisgender or, 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 or should I say, um, be uh, maneuvering in, um, in a stealth life. I know that word is kind of old and I don't wanna um, disrespect and be sensitive to everyone on the line, but there may be some women who are living a more stealth life because it may depend on where they're living and how they travel, who they, um, and, and also the people that they, that they may have um, relationships with. They don't want anyone to know their, um, how they identify or their or their um, gender identity, you know, and so they may be living a self life, and that may that may also um, give into the um, misinformation of data as well. Because I'm actually glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, as we know that when it comes to data collection, although it can be complex, it's very necessary, especially in the fight of HIV, and um, we know especially um, when it comes to either being trans or gender non-binary or a gender diverse individual, a lot of folks had to um, go stealth as a means of survival. So that might not be captured as well. So again, Anita, thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah, and before we move forward, I just wanna to add to that, Nevaeh, if I can. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like that's a great point, Anita. Thank you for bringing it up. And it also talks about, you know, we know that data, also tells us where money goes. And so data collection provides us with the financial resources to provide programming and resources to trans and gender, you know, expansive communities. And, you know, when we talk about data collection around some of the argument around why there aren't as many HIV services or programming for folks assigned female at birth is that the data doesn't support it. But similar to what you said, Anita, you know, if there are trans men who sleep with cisgender men or identify as gay men, on much of the paperwork, they're just going to put MSM or that they're men, and they're not going to put transgender, which, you know, will skew some of the data and continue to funnel a lot of the resources and the ways in which we see them now, as opposed to it being distributed more equitably and giving us a full scope of who might need the services, who, who's missing from the conversation, et cetera. So absolutely, the way that folks identify is very important. Um, and that is also why it's important to have forms that allow us to accurately track folks' identity um, and why SOGI forms are so important uh, and the way in which they're worded. So go ahead and advance, I'll go ahead and advance the slide for you. Okay, well, thank you again, Zami, for that. Um, so this um, shows us that sexual health programming has neglected certain communities when it comes to resources, prevention methods, and general education. We also don't know if the demographic information was accurately collect collected during testing. So this means that there is a possibility that a lot of trans masculine and gender non-binary individuals were overlooked. Um, and as Anita and Zami brought up, it could be for you know, those certain reasons. Um, so when it comes to trans masculine individuals, um, they're highly underrepresented in sexual health programming. Trans masculine and gender diverse AFAB individuals are often left out when it comes to family planning, HIV prevention and care, as well as thorough sexual health screenings. Stigma, lack of education, institutionalized racism, neglect and erasure of vulnerable communities and underrepresentation continue to be strong contrib contributing factors 
to inadequate sexual health programming, as well as inaccurate data collection. And this can be especially harmful for transgender and gender non-binary communities. Next slide, please. And quick, quick question, Nevaeh. Um, so I know for um, one of my coworkers, she she brings up all the time, and it and it always seems like perfect timing. Why is it that when as we collect data and we turn it in, how come when when the information is put out, it's put out years off or three to five years off, or 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 at best maybe two to three years? How come data isn't being released? In, in like real time, if that makes sense, like within six months to a year, how come it takes a few years for it to, to get out there? That part I'm not sure because I've always asked the same question myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, would if anybody else um, kind of knows anything about data, maybe we can briefly shed some light on that. Or I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and wait until we get into the um, brainstorming part of it. So that way we can kind of um, A, get like, um, A, be able to get accurate information about how data is collected and shared, and then also figure out what we can do to be solution oriented about it. Does that sound fair? Anita? Okay, perfect. So um, let's, so um, with this slide, it's absolutely vital that we speak openly and candidly when it comes to family planning regarding trans masculine, transgender and gender non-binary individuals. So although there is a misconception that one cannot conceive or impregnate an individual once they start hormone therapy, that is simply untrue. Trans masculine and gender non-binary APAP individuals are still able to get pregnant even, especially if they engage in unprotective receptive vaginal intercourse. In a study of 41 transmasculine individuals who became pregnant and gave birth, 61% of the participants had used testosterone before. And a quarter of those who were pregnant, um, those pregnancies were unplanned. In another study, the ovary structure of 40 transmasculine individuals were examined. And although they have been, um, although they have been on testosterone for over a year, 35 of those trans men were shown to go through a normal maturation process of their eggs at the same rate of cisgender women. For trans masculine individuals who do want to conceive and give birth, speaking to a healthcare specialist about stopping testosterone treatment is highly suggested as testosterone may cause birth, de birth defects, excuse me, to the fetus. Um, there should also be a conversation, um, an honest conversation for trans masculine individuals who do not want to conceive. This can include an honest yet culturally aware conversations about condoms, IUD, and other non-hormonal versions of birth control. Okay, next slide, please. This information shows us that there are, um, that there, there are, that there are a, that there is a misconception that individuals on hormone therapy cannot impregnate an individual or become pregnant. It is important to highlight this because there is a wide misconception that when an individual is on hormone therapy, it's impossible for them to get pregnant or to impregnate an AFAB individual. And as a result of that, transgender or gender non-binary AFAB individuals can experience a myriad of emotional, physical, and mental health. Gender and body dysmorphia are a real consequence for misinformation and lack of information. Aside from conflicting issues, such as identity and parenthood, deciding to proceed with an unwanted pregnancy, as well as a high risk of depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues. Transmasculine individuals also carry a high likelihood of financial burden. And considering the fact that trans and gender non-binary individuals are more than likely to live below the poverty level, whether one decides to keep the baby or determine, or I mean, to keep or to terminate the pregnancy, um, both options are considerably costly. Being pregnant while on testosterone can also carry serious health risks. One of those risks can affect the fetus if a trans masculine person is still taking testosterone. 
if a trans masculine person decides to go through with the pregnancy, then the reality is that they will have to stop taking testosterone, which can trigger gender dysphoria. Talking about prescribing a non-hormonal birth control like IUD or intrauterine device is critical for optimal family planning for trans masculine and gender non-binary AFAP individuals. This also shows us that there is a lack of cultural responsiveness and a need for additional training for sexual health educators and medical providers alike. The lack of comprehensive sexual health, health information can lead to greater issues that affect transgender and gender non-binary indi individuals. And this would include body dysmorphia, gender dysmorphia, potential financial burdens, and potential health risks due to lack of information. And they can all lead to negative consequences. Providing services to all AFAP individuals, regardless of gender identity or expression, not only encourages comprehensive sexual health programming, but it provides medical agency and autonomy to clients, helping them make the best choices for their health. Next slide, please. Now, this is the second poll that we will be taking. Um, so the question is, does your agency sexual health programming include assigned female at birth or AFAP individuals, um, including transgender individuals, gender non-binary AFAP individuals, and cisgender women? Um, the options are yes, no, and I don't know. And I'll give you a few moments to plug in your answer. We are currently at 50%. Okay. And if the poll doesn't work for you, feel free to enter your answer into the chat. And I'll go ahead and read those off. All right, everybody, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Okay, so for those of you who have participated in the poll, um, the answer, 65% um, of you all said yes, 15% um, said no, and 20% said I don't know. Um, which again, for the no's and the I don't know's, um, please don't think of that as a bad thing. Um, we're all learning this together. So again, thank you all for answering honestly and candidly. And for those of you who have answered yes, can you go into detail about what your services entail? Um, you're more than welcome to either take yourself off the of mute or add it in the chat. So how often do you, um, maybe, um, how often do you all see um, APAB individuals when it comes to testing or other um, sexual health programming? And you can also talk about outreach purposes, um, outreach, what that'll look like for you and your agency. Okay, so Tiffany um, responded at um, Vivent Health. Um, we offer our services to anyone. Um, I just stated, so I don't know exact numbers yet. Um, thank you for that, Tiffany. Um, it's good to know even with you starting your role um, that you are um, offering your services to everyone. So. Um, hi, this is Anita again. Um, uh, as as far as outreach um, is concerned, um, we, we pretty much go any and everywhere there's going to be an influx of people. Um, and we, we also make it a point to be where there are going to be a lot of people of color. And mm -hmm. so um, just recently, we had the Black Joy Parade that was out here in Oakland, California. And 
it was a massive turnout and we had a booth there and just the number of people that were coming um, because the name of our clinic is um, the Glenn Burke Wellness Clinic. Um, that was just an attention grabber there um, and for people to come up and to be able to talk. And also, um, we also use um, different um, information as far as like our support groups are concerned. And so we use people that look just like our focus population, you know, whether it's our Power X um, group, which is for our Latin and uh, our Latinx community, or our, um, we use um, uh, Black male identified as far as our Black male um, meetup group. We have a group called Hey Queens, which is for our um, women of trans experience that are African American, Latin. And so, um, you know, just with those advertisement efforts, we use people that look just like the demographic, which makes it, what makes it even more easier to pull people in, have people come talk to us. It's a really good conversation piece. Absolutely, and thank you. Um, and then Derek, I'm um, also put NASA, the sexual health programming is not limited to a certain population, but based on the mission, the data collection is targeted to a part certain population state, okay? Um, has anyone ever, um, has any organization ever participated in family planning around um, transgender individuals? And while we're thinking of that, I will go ahead and um, read a couple of more responses in the chat box. Let's see. So the first one, Derek includes, um, as far as outreach, each grant is targeted for specific demographics. Our outreach team utilizes different events, shopping centers, and highly traveled um, places to reach members in this community as partnerships, as well as, um, as, well as helps with numbers. So Derek, um, when it comes to um, certain demographics, do any of them include APAP individuals? And then Maritza says, here at Takes a Village, we are very inclusive when offering services. We go from outreaching to streets, homeless shelters, nightclubs, private and transgender par um, parties, targeting um, the African-American and Hispanic communities. Um, so when you are out, when you all are outreaching, does this include like AFAB individuals like transgender men, gender non-binary um, individuals who are assigned female at birth or cisgender women? And then also when it does come to family planning, um, have, have any of those included um, transgender or gender non-binary individuals? Sorry, um, I'm answering from Marissa because we work together for transactions here at the Village. Um, yeah, it is, we, we offer inclusive, mainly transgender, transgender women, but we also trans, um, offer transgender and non-binary and transmasculine um, services to those um, communities as well. And as far as planning for, um, what was the last question, sorry. Oh no, that's fine, um, just family planning, but. Um, oh yeah, family planning. Sorry, I don't think we've actually had anybody come in really wanting to talk about planning family planning yet. So that's not really something we worked with yet, but hopefully in the future. No, that's definitely understandable. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point in time, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Riley, who will be talking about PrEP and how equity shows up in PrEP. So take it away, Riley. Perfect. Thank you, Nevea. Um, I just saw that there was one more chat on recommendations on how to offer family planning support services when insurance typically does not cover. Um, I can I can try on that one. So um, I'm not sure if this is specifically around like uh, fertility assistance programming, things like that for, um, is that the question about like fertility assistance for trans patients? Um, the short of it is I, I don't have a, a magic funding source for that, unfortunately. It's a frank conversation I have with patients. Um, you know, there's, there's poor access to fertility services for patients of all genders. Um, so at least that's, uh, you know, equal, um, but it's, it's unfortunate. We're, we're trying to advocate for um, increased coverage for things like fertility care uh, within like, you know, by Medicaid um, in Colorado is something that's being advocated for. And I would um, encourage anyone who's doing that advocacy work to 
ensure that trans related fertility services get included within that. Um, I've seen it come up where like a trans patient might not get fertility services covered if they're not technically infertile in the sense that, you know, a heterosexual cisgender couple can prove that they are infertile and thus get, get covered for services. Um, so it's unfortunately something that there's a lot of different layers to. Um, but I think having those conversations with patients about things like sperm banking or egg freezing, um, if they're desiring fertility before starting hormones, but then the parallel to that being always uh, reminding patients that hormone therapy is not uh, is not contraception. So having to have that conversation from both sides. Um, I hope that sort of answered your question, but the short of it is, unfortunately, I don't know of too many resources for it. Um, Thank you guys for the other examples of programming that you're all doing. Um, when we look at sort of examining ways that equitable representation can look like, um, one of the ways is how we provide equitable services is looking at um, how we're sort of identifying behavioral risk and administering STI testing. Um, so in one study in 2019, uh, out of the 2,351 transgender people that were diagnosed with HIV, Actually, 15% of them were trans masculine. So this sort of changes some of the ways that we think about, you know, within the transgender umbrella, which patient populations are at risk for, for HIV. Um, in one smaller study that looked at uh, trans masculine individuals specifically, um, looking at sexual sort of sexual behaviors and risk factors, 24% of them were deemed eligible for PrEP services. So breaking that down, um, about 16% of them were having um, condomless receptive vaginal intercourse, 7% having condomless receptive anal sex, um, and 6% uh, had a recent STI infection or had more than five partners um, or were engaging in sex work. Uh, so you see there are risk behaviors there amongst transmasculine patients, um, but out of those uh, 439 people who were eligible for PrEP based on their behaviors, um, only 149 had actually received information about PrEP or counseling on PrEP and only 48 total had been actually prescribed PrEP. So we see a, a, about 10% were actually um, of eligible patients that actually gotten a PrEP prescription. Um, and, and you know we see that these statistics emphasize why we need to offer this unbiased sexual health screenings and testings um, and make sure we're having these conversations with all of our patients and not making assumptions about their behavior based on their identity. We can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, kind of building off that when we talk about PrEP specifically, um, we should be offering PrEP to um, AVAB individuals uh, in supporting their sexual health. When we provide all options to our clients, we empower them to make more informed decisions uh, and to help optimize their sexual health and thrive as individuals. Um, we're now going to show a video about how Planned Parenthood in New York is practicing gender equity with their sexual health programming that includes PrEP. And do we have that video up ready? I think that was the second one, Tommy. Yeah, perfect six. You are a woman. Within you, there is great strength, independence, and wisdom. So take your health into your own hands. HIV can impact the health of all women, especially women of color. But PrEP is a once daily pill that reduces the risk of HIV through sex by more than 90%. Right now, New York State has one of the highest HIV rates in the nation. And among the women in our state who were recently diagnosed, nearly all were infected through sex with a male partner. Emotional, physical, and sexual abuse can increase vulnerability to HIV. And HIV can have a bigger impact in communities with limited access to healthcare, where unstable housing and poverty make things worse. Black women make up about 60% of all new HIV cases among women, despite making up only 13% of women in the nation. Our sisters, mothers, and daughters deserve better. PrEP is an option, an option for you and me. Many don't know PrEP is widely available or think it's only for gay men, but PrEP is for women too. I can't expect a one night stand to care about my health. With my survival mind, I decided to take PrEP for me. HIV is more common than you realize, especially in communities of color. To learn more about PrEP, visit yourbodyneedsyou.org.
Awesome. Thank you. Um, so again, that, you know, that video was specific, obviously was specifically talking um, mostly to, to cisgender women and to that, um, some of that data that Nevea had referenced of uh, increased rates is particularly among um, African-American cisgender women and, and Latinx uh, cisgender women, but also with brainstorming sort of ways that we can, um, you know, include trans masculine folks who are assigned female at birth or non-binary folks, because um, there's lots of different ways that that can look. And I think um, as, as wide of different, you know, populations that we can target um, with our prep advertising uh, and prep outreach is really important. Um, in the next session, we're going to go into a lot greater detail on how to, um, you know, it, it get a affirming sexual health history to assess for risk factors and um, indications for PrEP, um, particularly when talking to and working with transgender individuals. Um, and we're going to go into some greater detail on actually prescribing PrEP and um, its various forms. And so um, I'll be uh, primarily leading that session with, uh, with Maya's help, but um, it'll be a great one to invite other um, you know, providers, uh, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, anyone who you have working with you who's dealing directly with patients and, and with prescribing PrEP. Thank you for that, Riley. Um, so we are um, a bit over time. Um, so we will be going, we will be um, combining our brainstorm and our Q&A piece together. But before we do that, I would like to go on to meet Tori Cooper. Tori is the first openly Black transgender woman to serve on the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. Tori is an ex excellent example on how gender equity and representation can positively, blah, positively impact sexual health programming, as well as make sexual health programming more comprehensive overall. And including adequate, and represent, including adequate representation and equitable practices will ensure that like Tori, other trans and gender non-binary individuals are being included in not only sharing their experiences, but are recipients of affirming and accurate sexual health programming practices. And at this point in time, I'm gonna pass it over to Zami. Thank you all so much for um, coming to this community of practice and I hope to see you at the next session. Thank you. Before we wrap up, we want to, there's actually an answer in the chat for Anita, if Anita is still on. Um, so Terry Stewart plays that regarding delayed data reporting, one explanation is the larger, is the larger the set of data, the longer it takes to release. Data at a county level will be available much sooner than data at a federal level due to the sheer size of the data and the desire to be sure it is accurate as possible before it's released to preserve credibility. Data is reported from the agency level to the county or sometimes regional uh, level to the state level to the federal level. Sadly, it's not a perfect system. So if Anita's still on, that answers some of your question. Um, and Thank then you. I Thank you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, and then I also wanted to go back to Lotus's question a little bit around insurance. So depending on what uh, the family planning is, then it's all about how folks uh, document it or code it. So if the family planning is how to have access to uh, like IUDs or birth control or, you know, different pregnancy prevention, then even if on the insurance and the person's documentation, it's labeled male or female, but their assigned gender at birth is different. As long as the provider uses the proper code, the insurance company has to cover it. So it really goes back to making sure that our providers are accomplices and allies to us um, and also work as advocates and navigators in the um, exam room so that when they go to do the billing codes, the billing codes in alignment with what it is that we're seeking. Similar to when folks go to get like pap smears or different annuals, um, some people say, oh, well, this isn't going to be covered. Um, or when people are trying to get things like hysterectomies, et cetera, um, as long as a provider codes it the correct way, then your insurance will, co will cover it. Typically when folks run into issues with the insurance is when the provider will 
put the code under gender affirming care or trans care and then sometimes those insurance companies don't want to cover it the way that they would cover the service if the person was cisgender so it really just depends on who the provider is whether they're willing to do some of that billing um, and what type of what type of family planning services the person is looking for um, so thank you all uh, again. Thank you for being patient with us in the beginning and thank you for staying on a little bit longer as well. Our next session will be session two on equitable access and representation and sexual health with a huge focus on prep. We'll be going over the different labs that people get and why people are getting those labs. A lot of times folks will get labs and they don't know why they're being drawn. Um, but Dr. Smith is going to explain why we're getting those different labs, which prep should be um, provided to someone based off of where um, their assignment at birth as well. There are some preps that are for cer certain folks, but not for other folks. And we'll be able to explain why and why that's important. Also talking about some intramuscular forms of prep and not just the different pills. So if you just wanna have some additional information on prep and how it affects the gender expansive community and ways to provide it to us, we encourage you to be here. Also encourage you to provide your nurse practitioners, your pharmacists, your prep providers, and your prep navigators so that they can do a more thorough conversation with trans and gender expansive communities as well. Um, that is on April 26 from 11 to 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So for folks who had to change their clocks, remember the time is a little bit different. So Mountain Standard Time and if you are needing technical assistance, if you're a directly funded CDC um, organization, you can do a request through CTS. If you are not, you can email me directly at zami.hemingway at dhha.org. Um, and by 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, you all will receive an evaluation. Please fill out the evaluation. It helps us create um, better programming and webinars and take you all into account moving forward. So thank you all again so much. We are looking forward to next month and have a great rest of your day.